Quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. So, Steve, it's 2024. Wow, that went fast. It did go really fast. <laughs> and I've been looking at my calendar, and I have a date that you need to mark. Oh. March 10th are the Oscars. The Oscars are all right yes. around the corner. I cannot wait. Oh, and, we love them. And they're going to be on earlier this year. So check Why? your local listings. I think it's because they want the East Coast to stay awake. And, you know, speaking of the Oscars, that's what we're here to talk about today, because we're talking about... What what I call beginner's luck. I'm sure there's more than luck that goes to it. Yes. It's all about the actors and actresses who won an Oscar on their very first film. Yeah, I'm there's so some excited. great people on this list. And some people that you may not know about, they got this great part, they won an Oscar, and then they kind of went, went away. away. Yeah, yeah, so it's interesting. This will yeah. be fun. All right. Who is the first person that we're going to talk about? Well, the first person who won the Oscar for her screen debut, and it's another great character actress who we give a lot of love to on this podcast. It's Gail Sondergaard. We do love Gail Sondergaard. We love Gail. A little primer on Gail, if you don't know. She's kind of known for three things. She was the original choice to play the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz. Right, when she was going to be the glamorous she Wicked She was going to be the sexy glam witch, and they decided that that wasn't going to work, right. so they booted her and brought in Margaret Hamilton. She was a victim of the blacklist, a very famous victim of the blacklist. She was married to one of the Hollywood 10, writer, director, Herbert Biberman. And the third thing she's known for, she won the Best Supporting Actress for her very first film in 1936 called Anthony Adverse. That scene where Frederick March comes back and she enters the door <laughs> and they have that little repartee. Woo, she's an evil woman. Yes. And, you know, she just had this incredibly strong presence on film mm -hmm. that was like no one else. She was regal. She was dark. She was oddly sexy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, she had all of that. Yeah, but you knew she meant business. <laughs> oh, yeah. You were not going to mess with that woman. And when you look at some of her past performances, you know, I think she sort of became almost a cult figure when she played the Spider Woman in Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman, you know, she just really perfected that cool, aloof, evil woman. Yeah. And nobody played it better than her. Nobody. And obviously she won the Oscar for the first time out. Yeah. But the Blacklist really did curtail her career. Another one yeah. of these people that you just wonder what they would have gone on to do oh, had that it, not happened. Oh, it breaks your heart because she was so talented. Yeah. You wonder what we missed out on seeing. But people probably remember her. She had a wonderful career before the Blacklisting. She was in The Letter with Betty Davis uh, and she played the scorned wife of her lover and she doesn't have much dialogue but that presence that she has in uh -huh. that movie is unforgettable. She's also great in The Mark of Zorro with Tyrone Power and Linda Darnell. She received another Oscar nomination in 1946 when she played an ally of Irene Dunn's Anna in The King of Siam, ah, which right. of course is what The King and I is based on. Right. The interesting thing about her is she had this brilliant career. She was blacklisted. Her career stopped on a dime. And do you know who the person was who pulled her back into the spotlight and got her back into action? in 1970. No, who? It's a fascinating story. It was Robert Wagner. Really? He did. He was friends with her, and he, I think, was so heartbroken about her being blacklisted for all these decades. At the time, he was doing a TV series called It Takes a Thief. Yes. And he convinced her to come back and make this TV show with him, which was the first time she'd appeared before a camera in 20 years. And it really gave her a little second boost of a career. You know, she did TV movies. She did The Night Gallery, Police Story, The Fall Guy. She kind of got to come back and relive her former glory. And if you haven't seen it, you've got to see the TV movie in 1973 that she made with Meredith Baxter called The Cat Creature. It really harkens back to her old, dark, sexy, evil ladies that she's so perfected. Yeah, for which she won the Academy Award. Yes. All right. I think there's no luck in her winning that. I think she's truly a talent. Sheer talent. And you know, she's also from Minnesota like you. <laughs> I love hearing that. There's still hope. 
<laughs> All right. Our next actress is from 1943, and I'm not going to try to pronounce her name because I don't know how to say it. It's Katina Paxino, okay. a wonderful, wonderful Greek-born actress who was primarily a stage actress. She was a founding member of the National Theater of Greece. I mean, she was huge oh, wow. in the Greek yeah. theater. She had appeared on Broadway in a couple of huge productions. She was most known for playing Hedda Gabler in 1942. Ah. One of my favorite plays. When they decided to make a film out of the Ernest Hemingway epic war novel For Whom the Bell Tolls, there is a particular part called Pilar who Mm -hmm. was really hard to cast because she was this local and she was gritty and she was intense and she was dark and she was this rebellious guerrilla fighter who helps Gary Cooper basically blow up a bridge that kind of helps in the war efforts. And so when they were casting it, they realized they had this incredible act actress from Broadway that they could bring out to Hollywood and give her the role. And that's how Katina Paxino got her first film. And she was nominated as well for Best Actress in a Supporting Role. She was, and she won. And she won for her in screen 1943. Debut. Now, did she have a career post winning the Oscar? Unfortunately, she was a very specific character type, and there weren't tons of roles for her after she did For Whom the Bell Tolls. So she didn't have a great Hollywood career after that. She had this craggy face, these expressive eyes, but she had trouble finding parts. But she is fantastic. If you haven't seen Morning Becomes Electra from 1947 with Rosalind Russell, she plays Rosalind Russell's murderous mother. Oh. And I'll say no more. Okay. She's, she's so good in that role. And I love Morning Becomes uh, But you know, she Electra. basically went back to, I think, theater. Didn't have a huge Hollywood career. Okay. Next up is a gentleman that we've talked about pretty regularly on this podcast. And we love him. And we love him. Harold Russell, 1946. Harold Russell. I don't think there's much we haven't said about him. He was a real life veteran who'd lost his limbs in the war. And he was just the perfect person to play Homer in William Wyler's classic movie, The Best Years of Our Lives. Yeah. You just can't think of that film without first thinking of him. And of course, he was nominated for an Oscar, but because of his contribution, they decided to give him a special Oscar just because of his contribution and Mm -hmm. being the veteran. Now, what happened to him after the best years of our lives? You know, unfortunately, because of the times, he didn't have a lot of opportunities because of his disabilities. Right. But he did have somewhat of a comeback in the 1980s when director Richard Donner recruited him for a small role in this drama called Inside Moves, which Mm -hmm. is a really good movie. And it's about this group of disabled people who find solace in each other in this neighborhood bar. Another interesting thing about Harold Russell, and this is a fun tidbit about the Academy as well, in 1992, his wife was in really poor health Mm. and he needed money. And so he decided that he was going to put one of his Oscars up for auction. Okay. But the Academy in 1951 had added a rule that any Oscar recipient who wanted to sell their Oscar had to offer it to them first for $1. I remember that rule. But because, of course, Russell won his before 1951, he was he able to... could sell it. He could auction off his Oscar. And so he did. So on August the 6th, 1992, in New York City, his Oscar... Oscar was sold to a private collector for $60,500. And then after Russell died in 2002, and I love this, this is so wonderful, it was revealed that that private collector who bought Russell's Oscar was Universal Studios chief Lou Wasserman. Okay. And Wasserman donated the Oscar back to the Academy. Well, couldn't he have just given him the (laughs) $60,000 and let him keep the Oscar? (laughs) I'm just saying. Maybe he wanted to (laughs) give him a little dignity. I don't know. (laughs) Way to go, Lou. (laughs) But I love that the the Oscar is back at the Academy, which is nice. where it should be. Next actor is from 1949, and I know her from a couple of things that I hope we'll get to talk about. Mercedes McCambridge. Oh, one of my favorites. Oh, I say that about everybody, I though. I know, but it's okay. That's why That's why we have a podcast, she, is she because was, we get to talk about exactly. all our favorites. <laughs> she was so special. One of my favorite books growing up was the Robert Penn Warren political drama, All the King's Men. Mm-hmm. And one of my favorite characters in the book was the very complicated Sadie Burke. She was 
the assistant lover and sort of power broker to Willie Stark, who is this ambitious small town politician who really gets seduced into corruption by power and greed. Mm -hmm. And he was played by the incredible Broderick Crawford. Yes. And the movie was directed by the great Robert Rawson in 1949. And the book was loosely based on the political dynasty of Huey Long back in Louisiana. Yes. Which, of course, you know, he was the governor of Louisiana from the late 20s into the 30s. He was assassinated. So that's what Robert Penn Warren based the novel on, Hmm. which I always find so interesting. I think that's really interesting. Now, she went on to have a career in many other films. One of them that I just loved and I saw a long time ago, A Touch of Evil from 1958. Yes, she is in A Touch of Evil. She had an interesting career. She could have had trouble getting cast, Mm -hmm. but for some reason, she always landed in these incredible and interesting roles. And that's a prime example of it. Orson Welles. Such a good movie. It's, she was a real chameleon, I yes, think. Yes, she was. I find it funny that after she won the Oscar for All the King's Men, she had a little bit of trouble getting traction. And uh-huh. they ended up, I don't think Hollywood knew what to do with her. So yeah. they put her in these random movies. And one I really liked, it was called Lightning Strikes Twice in 1951, which was this B-movie film noir with Ruth Roman and Richard Todd. But she always tended to play masculine and evil. Yeah, yeah. There was a, a little bit of a darkness about her. Yeah, but I think things changed a little bit for her in 1954 when she was cast opposite Joan Crawford in Johnny Guitar. Mm -hmm. It definitely had some lesbian undertones to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was about these two strong Western women who were gauchos and... Right. (laughs) Hung out together. Hung out together, but but hated each other. (laughs) Yeah. Right. But a really good movie. And she went toe-to-toe with Joan Crawford and held her own. So good good on her. (laughs) And... Giant. George Stevens is giant. Which was her second Oscar nomination. Mm -hmm. And and she's wonderful as Rock Hudson's sister, kind of controlling, manipulative sister. The final thing, one of the final things that she did, I just heard her on a rebroadcast. I think it was of Terry Gross's Fresh Air. And she was interviewed and talks about the voice that she created (sighs) as the devil in The Exorcist. Yes, she is that horrible, awful, you know, Reagan's voice that comes out of that little girl. How long are you planning to stay in Reagan? Until she rots and lies stinking in the earth. What's that? Holy water. You keep it away. Uh, uh, it burns! Uh, it burns! And Amazing. If you can find that episode, she talks about the process by which she came to find that <laughs> voice. And and it's amazing. I mean, yes. you know, and she does it. And it, you just kind of go, oh, my gosh. Oh, it's chilling. <laughs> it's it's chilling. Chilling. But yeah. what an interesting career from debut film wins an Oscar to The Exorcist, yes. the evil voice. Yes. Yeah. Yep. She's amazing. I think it's time, Steve, for our Hollywood pop quiz. Yes. So the pop quiz quiz question of the day is and it's going to tie in here just be patient with us <laughs> in the 1990s classic sitcom Frasier who played the mother of producer Roz Doyle played by the incredible Perry Gilpin we love you Perry we Gilpin we love you Perry so that's our question all right I think I know the answer to this and we'll be back right after this with more Oscar winners yes Okay, Steve and Ann will be right back, but first, another stop on the Hollywood tour. A while back, we told you that Joanne Woodward was the very first person to get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, right? That was back in 1960. But did you know there are five different fields of entertainment on the Hollywood Walk of Fame? They are film, TV, radio, live performance, and music. Now get this, only one person has all five stars, one in each recognized category. Here to guess who it is? It's cowboy legend Gene Autry. But a few others came up a pretty close second, coming in with three stars each are Bob Hope, Mickey Rooney, Roy Rogers, and Tony Martin. And now back to Steve and Ann from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. Our next actor that we're going to talk about in this episode of people that made their film debut and were nominated and won the Academy Award. Oh, I love her. 1952, Shirley Booth. Yes, the incomparable Shirley Booth, who made her mark on Broadway before she ever appeared in a film. And it was a Broadway play that got her to Hollywood Mm. because she appeared in the hit William Inge play, Come Back Little Sheba. 
Yes. And when they decided to make the film version, of course, they recruited her from Broadway, but she was not the first choice. They went really? through other options before they finally gave in and brought <sighs> Shirley Booth out here yeah. because they didn't think she had the name recognition. You know, I think of a lot of actors like Kathy Bates yes. in um, Frankie and Johnny. Yes. You know, and I love Michelle Pfeiffer, but... Oh. Kathy Bates. Or or Jessica Tandy in Streetcar. Although yes. Vivian Lee was perfection. Vivian Lee was perfection. That yes. must have broken her heart. Yeah. But Shirley Booth got to play the role. <laughs> she got to play the role, which is kind of a rarity. Yeah. Um, and she was incredible. It is one of those gut-wrenching roles that you just have to see it to, to understand how emotional that is. And yes. that couple dealing with that sadness and that loss, and it will take your breath away. Yeah. You know, I recently saw a production of it here in Los Angeles with a friend of mine who is one of my favorite actresses and who won the Ovation Award for playing the role, Deborah Strang. She oh, is a phenomenal yes. actress. So she, shout out to Deborah. She is a wonderful actress. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Now, after the film, she wins the Academy Award. She's playing opposite Burt Lancaster. What happens to her career after the win? You know, not a lot. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, again, I th well, A, I think she was so rooted in the theater and she loved the theater so much. I mean, she'd already won a Tony in 1949 for Goodbye My Fancy. So I think the theater was her life. Yeah, she loved and the theater. I don't think she enjoyed making movies. I don't think that was her thing. It's such a different process, yes. right? It is. So I think she basically went back to New York and that's where she was most effective. But she did make a few movies. I think she appeared in four more movies after okay. uh, Come Back Little Sheba. One was uh, about Mrs. Leslie in 1954. That's probably the only one of any note. Um, but so she basically did. went back to New York. And won two Tonys. Uh, well, she did when she went back to New York. She won another Tony, which right. actually would have been her third. Because oh, my she, goodness. She won for Come Goodbye back. My Fancy, Come right. Back. And then she won one again in 1953 for The Time of the Cuckoo. Oh. Which I don't know I that don't play. I don't know that play either. But three-time Tony Award winner. And, of course, a lot of us know her well, as Hazel. I know. If anybody knows her today at all, it's because she played <laughs> everybody's favorite busybody maid, Hazel, which... You know, was just one of my childhood favorites. Oh, yeah. And she won two Emmys. And she did. And the way she bossed around Mr. B, it was just oh, brilliant. It was, and her, her <laughs> voice, I mean, I can just hear her right now. So she was a Grammy Award away from yes. EGOT status. She was. She had the others. But, you know, incredible actress, really special. I, I love her. Yeah, I do too. All right. Our next actress. I had a fleeting moment with this actress. Ooh, do tell. Well, I was in a play when I first moved out to Los Angeles at a little theater in Studio City and we had finished the performance and I heard that this woman had been in the audience and was out in the hallway and I was gonna go out and see her <laughs> and get her to tell me how wonderful I was <laughs> I didn't care and I walked out and I said it was Eva Marie Saint oh. and I stopped myself because I wasn't sure her name flummoxed me a bit in the moment and so I wasn't sure if I should say Miss Marie Saint it's so nice to meet you or if I should say Miss Saint. I opted with Miss Saint. I would think that would be right. I think that's right. I didn't want to call her Eva. Yes. I mean, my gosh, I was, you know, wanted to bow down before yeah, her. Of but, course. Yeah. Of course. But that's my fleeting moment with her. Oh, yeah. was she just she as was, lovely as you would she hope? She was lovely, exquisite, and very complimentary. And it was it was a thrill. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a bucket list moment. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Eva Marie Saint, an incredible, lovely, subtle actress. And that's what I really appreciate about her is how subtle she was. Right. She had started out in television. Which, which I, I didn't realize. I don't think a lot of people knew. And and one of the things that she did early on, I think is incredible, was she did a televised version of Horton Foote's wonderful play, The Trip to Bountyful. Oh, wow. She did that in 1953. And Lillian Gish played the lead. She played Carrie. And it also starred Joe Van Fleet, who played the daughter-in-law, Jessie May, which I think steals the play Almost. Yes, it's a great role. And even Marie Saint played the young girl that Carrie encounters while she's trying to get back okay, home to Bountiful. Okay. 
She had this great TV career, and then Elia Kazan is making a film called On the Waterfront. 1955. 1955. He's looking for the perfect ingenue to play the love interest of the ex-boxer Terry Malloy, played there, by Marlon Brando. And there was a lot of competition for the role. There was a lot of competition for the role. I mean, I think everybody in town tried out for this role. Claire Trevor, Jan Sterling, Nina Foch. Elia Kazan saw something really special in Eva Marie Saint, and he ended up casting her in such a important role mm-hmm. in the movie that it, it just adds the softness to a kind of gritty tale and she was incredible and the film was nominated for 12 academy awards it won eight yes including best picture best director best actor for brando and eva marie saint and eva marie saint film debut Mm. and that was back before brando did whatever brando did to himself that made him horrible yes (laughs) when he was such a good actor he was he was you know long before superman and all that stuff right But you know what? Eva Marie, I think she was a very versatile actress, even though she was never Oscar nominated again, which I find that a little surprising because she was so good. But I particularly loved her in A Hat Full of Rain in 1957 with Don Murray and Rain Tree County with Montgomery Clift and Elizabeth Taylor. She's the anti-Liz sort of in that movie. She is. (laughs) And North by Northwest. um, One of my favorites. Which, if you've ever been to the Academy Museum, you can see that backdrop and have your picture taken and pretend that you're Eva Marie Saint. (laughs) And I like that. That role because she's a little devious she and she's is. sort of sexually aggressive, yes, which you don't think of even Marie Saint as being. It's why I love her in that. Yeah, role. she's it's yeah, so it's good. It just of... shows her versatility. One cool thing about her is she enjoyed like a 65 year marriage, which I think you should win an award alone for that in <sighs> yes. Hollywood. You know, she was married to director producer Jeffrey Hayden for 65 years, yep. and I just love that. Yeah, and she's still with us, and she's so, still with us, going uh, strong lo- at 99. 99, and we'd love to have you on the podcast. <laughs> so if you're out there, Eva Marie, <laughs> yes, please come talk to us. Please come talk to us. <laughs> I just recently watched, as I mentioned to you earlier, the film East of Eden. Oh. So so good. Rewatched it, and this next actress, I think she's in yeah. one scene she's in the film. Very limited is who our next topic is going to be, and that is Joe Van Fleet from 1955. Yes, again, she's another actress who started on Broadway. It's funny how many great actors and actresses we got from New York. She was a Shakespearean actress. She'd appeared in The Winter's Tale mm. in 1946 and King Lear in wow. 1950. And so see her in King Lear. <laughs> She'd won the Tony, and this is interesting because. She won her Tony as Best Featured Actress in a Play for portraying Jessie Mae Watts in The, the Trip, Trip to, to Bountiful, Bountiful, which we just talked about. Because they had done it previously as a televised version, yes. and then and it then went to Broadway. To Broadway. Okay. And Joe Van Fleet, so justifiably, I'm sure, I didn't see it, but I'm sure, yes. for playing Jessie Mae, which also still starred Lillian Gish and Eva Marie Saint. And she studied at Lee Strasberg's famed actor studio, right? Yes, and she was under the tutelage of director Elia Kazan, okay. which comes into play here, because when Kazan yes. came back to Hollywood, he was hired to direct John Steinbeck's East of Eden in 19. 19- 55, and he remembered her from class. And so he (laughs) cast... Oh Joe gosh. Van Fleet in this plum role of James Dean's very complicated mother. Where is Elia Kazan in my acting class to bring me back and star in a movie? Come on! I remembered her from class, and yes. so I'm going to give her this plum role. And she is so... I mean, that scene... Yes. She was just an actress of depth. Yes. And complexity and... Specificity. And yes. And, and so good in this. And of course, she was nominated and won the Best Supporting Actress Oscar for that screen debut. And she quickly followed of this up. She then was cast in the movie version of The Rose Tattoo. Also 1955. Right. And also co-starred Burt Lancaster and the recently departed Marissa Pavan. Oh, Who was so good the, as the daughter. Yes. But one movie that I particularly love her in, and I don't know that a lot of people remember this, but she played Susan Hayward's horrible, <laughs> domineering stage mother in I'll Cry Tomorrow, yes. which was a story of Lillian Roth. Okay, so that was 19- 
1955 as well. These are three. Same year. And I, I think they just released dates were sure, 55, sure. but who knows when, what, yeah. I don't even know what orderly shot a man. Right. But she was having a real surge in her career. Real surge. Yeah. And such a specific type, but she mm-hmm. found work. I mean, she worked for decades after this. She worked with our friend Eleanor Parker in Four Queens <laughs> and a King. She did. She was Doc Holliday's girlfriend in Gunfight at the OK Corral with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas. Not bad for leading men. Right, right. Oh, and one of my all-time favorites, she is that stubborn Tennessee hillbilly woman who refuses to leave her land when the TVA is trying to create these hydraulic dams and flood out her town in Wild River, 1960, with Montgomery Clift and Lee Remick. Yeah. And Paul Newman's dying mother in Cool Hand Luke. Yes. 1967. Yes. One one scene and she slays. She just slays in one scene. I mean, yes. if, when you can do that, you know. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. Our next actress, who doesn't love Julie Andrews? Oh, we love Julie Andrews. Yes. The hills are alive. Our four octave friend. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know, and of course she started acting and singing early when she was a kid back she in did. England. She just had that incredible voice like no other. And that voice is what eventually led her to Broadway. She made her Broadway debut in 1954 in the musical The Boyfriend. Yes. Which was incredibly critically praised. And her career was interesting because she goes Broadway, TV, back to Broadway, and eventually lands in movies. Right. Before she ever appeared in a feature film, she did a lot of TV. She was in this Bing Crosby TV movie called High Tour. And then she did that great special with Carol Burnett, who was her very close friend. Yeah, I think it was called Julie and Carol at Carnegie Hall. Yes. And, you know, she also, we were talking about actors who weren't given the opportunity to play Uh, roles that they originated. Yes. She originated the role of Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady in 1956 and did not play it in the film. She did not. And, you know, the man who created My Fair Lady, Jay Lerner, he was really hoping she'd get the role. Mm-hmm. But the movie sold to Warner Brothers and Jack Warner didn't think that Julie Andrews had name recognition. Yeah. So they gave it to Audrey Hepburn instead, hmm. who couldn't sing, by the way. So they had to dub her voice. Right. I well, think about how much money they could have saved by bringing in Julie. You wouldn't have to hire that singer. Right. And look <laughs> look where Julie Andrews went anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can't, can't stop Julie because right. basically was it, what, two years, a few years later when she gets cast? Asked is Mary Poppins. Yes, in Mary night- Poppins. She wins the Academy Award for Best Actress. Yes. And of course, the following year goes on to oh. Maria von Trapp and The Sound of Music and on and on and oh, on and on. Thoroughly Modern, Millie, Darling Lil, all those Pink Panther movies. Yes, um, yes. Ten, Victor Victoria. Yes. Yeah, I mean, she is just a icon, yeah. I, I think. And she did receive another Academy Award nomination for Victor Victoria, she if did. I'm not she mistaken. She did. She's so good in that movie. Yeah, she is. But it just goes to show you, never give up. No, never <laughs> Even if you, give if you up. don't get that movie that you originated on Broadway, <laughs> right. don't give up. Don't give up. You still are going to win the Oscar. Yes. <laughs> All right. Our final actor, actress, is the year was 1967, and it's Babs. Babs. How can we leave out Barbara Streisand? Yeah. And jokingly, I, I said to you earlier, I said, I don't even want to talk about Babs because what can we possibly say that she hasn't already written in that thousand page tome she just came out with? I know, but with? you know what? I can't wait to uh, read it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. There, you know there's some great stories. There's what a be career. Great stories. Yeah. I mean, lover or hater, the woman is an icon and she has had a, an amazing career. She shifted things for women in Hollywood yeah. with her directing film and, and producing. And producing. And That's the part I find interesting is yeah. her producing track. Yep. I didn't realize until I did a little research for this that she got her first break as the opening act for comedian Phyllis Diller. Yeah. I love that. As a bonsoir, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, of course, she went to Broadway and she was a hit and she did off-Broadway plays. And what really, I think, got her notice was when she was cast on Broadway in I Can Get It For You Wholesale. Now, isn't there a famous story about her auditioning for that play? And she comes <laughs> on stage and she is chewing gum and she takes the gum out very dramatically and puts it under the chair and then goes on to <laughs> sing her song. And then she leaves. And the producer or whoever she was auditioning for goes to look and there's 
there's no gum. She's oh. acted the whole thing. Am I making this up? I don't know, but I love that story. <laughs> it's a good That's story. That's amazing. <laughs> what she did get from I Can Get It For You Wholesale, besides critical praise, was she got a husband. That's where, <laughs> that's where she met Elliot Gould. <laughs> okay, more importantly than that, she got a Tony knob. <laughs> she got a Tony knob and a husband and a lot of and praise. she was on her way. Because next is Funny Girl, which oh, we know yes. is on Broadway now and is coming to Los Angeles yes, in a little bit. Yes, yes. Julie Stein and Bob Merrill, their production of Funny Girl, which really took Broadway by storm back then. Again, it gained her another Tony nomination, and that's what got her to Hollywood. And what she does with that role with Funny Girl is what we've talked about with Katherine Hepburn in terms of Philadelphia story. You cannot see anyone Anyone. else in the role. Yes, She defines it as her own. Yes. The year that she won was one of the very few times in Oscar history that there was actually a tie. And she tied with Katherine Hepburn for A Lion in Winter. Okay, that's a pretty good person to tie with. Uh, yes, in, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of like, I want to tie with Meryl Streep. Yes. <laughs> that would be as good as just getting it by yourself, right? It boggles my mind to think with all the tens of thousands of Academy voters, yes. how can there be a tie? I know. Exactly It does a tie. kind of make you... Um, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. We need to investigate this. <laughs> but are, are, are Babs or Kate going to give up an Oscar? I, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. I mean, she follows that up with another musical, Hello Dolly. Yes. And on a clear day, and you again, can see we're, forever. And again, I want to go back a little bit sure. because we, it's a little bit of a theme of ours is when she was cast in Hello Dolly. Yes. Of course, the great Carol Channing had made it famous on, on Broadway, Broadway and she didn't get the opportunity to play the role which yes. I think is, is a shame it's kind of the reverse because Carol is. Channing was a name yeah I mean at the and, time and she was Hello Dolly to she me she was, was she was Dolly Levi yeah so she follows that with On a Clear Day You Can See Forever 1969 directed by the great Vincent Minnelli and then her career kind of shifts a little bit away from musicals The Owl and the Pussycat in 1970 with, yes directed by Herbert Ross good old Herbert Ross mm-hmm. all those Pink Panther movies Yet again, yep, yep. <laughs> I think it was those four monster hit movies that really launched her into the stratosphere. Yeah, I mean, she there was nothing holding her back then. She became a list star and never looked back. Yeah, I got to see her perform live, and it was a thrill. I was have it to say, good concert. I could barely see her because my tickets were so far <laughs> away. But it was it was worth being able to see. I've seen Barbara Streisand live. Yeah, don't you have to mortgage the house to get a ticket to one <laughs> of her concerts? Yeah. Yes. I think it was down at the the pond. So it was quite a big venue. (laughs) If you look at Streisand, she's won two Oscars, five Emmys, nine Grammys, nine Golden Globes, three Peabody's, the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award, and she won a special Tony. Not bad for a gypsy girl from Brooklyn. Oh boy, I'm with you there. I think it's time for the answer to our Hollywood pop quiz. Yes. And the question was, in the 1990s classic sitcom Frasier, who played Perry Gilpin's character Roz Doyle's mother? I'm going to say it's Eva Marie Saint. It is indeed Eva Marie Saint. The character was introduced earlier, and, and there were several episodes where Perry would be on the phone with her mother, usually giving the most intimate personal details of her life. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sort of a comic thing yeah, running through. And then they finally cast the mother for one episode and they brought in Eva Marie Saint, which to me is not the woman you would think would be Roz Doyle's mother. Right, right. Because <laughs> Eva Marie is so elegant and sophisticated and Roz is so Roz and, and right. wonderful and earthy and fun. And, right. Yeah. Well, that that is a really fun story. I love yeah, that. And you know, I, I'm just going to add something else. Eva Marie Saint also played Sybil Shepherd's mother in Moonlighting. Oh, she did. Yeah, it just came to me. So she was quite the classic TV mother. Yeah, she was. I think those Moonlighting episodes are available now again Finally. on streaming. Yes. Yeah. Well, we hope that you've enjoyed this episode, and we'd love it if you would follow us on social media. Our handle is at From Beneath the Hollywood Sign, and you can find us on Instagram and Facebook and on YouTube. And we'd love to hear from you with any questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> no concerns. <laughs> I hope no concerns. But just, uh, be sure and email us at info at from beneath the Hollywood sign.com. That's this week's view. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. You've been listening to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign with Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara, the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of Tinseltown from its golden era. Join us next week for another episode and learn something else about Hollywood you probably never knew. Take a 
moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive review. And tell your friends about us, too. It'll help grow the podcast. Visit Steve's website at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com. The executive producers are Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara. Executive producer and post-production supervisor, Lindsay Schneble. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit AirwaveMedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schneble and Toth. Copyright 2024, all rights reserved. That's a wrap. The instrument, you know, Mm. the instrument. Oh, yes, darling. That's going to become the Easter egg. (laughs) Yeah.